Right, let's get started. Let's just zoom through these uh, risk warnings. So certainly uh, an interesting week last week and uh, probably going to be uh, another one this week. Not sure how many of the participants here had trades in Swiss francs, um, certainly volatile, um, not in any sense of the word a typical occurrence in, uh, in currency markets. It, I have never seen a 40% move in a currency like that. That was absolutely unprecedented. Um, we may as well start by just having a quick look at the... Um, you know, we, I think we all probably know the fundamental situation behind it, uh, namely that that peg with the euro and obviously the Swiss National Bank keeping that peg on to try and artificially devalue their currency. Um, you know, this is the range we currently find ourselves in after this absolute crash down from that 120 peg but it's you know it's, it's just difficult to properly look at a, a daily chart now but if, you did, if we do kind of scroll back you know this has made it a bit difficult to see but essentially what what had happened is that we this is very difficult maybe if I as you can see we did actually have a range in the um, in the Euro Swiss, with a kind of higher floor, um, which, which was close to sort of 122, about sort of you know, 121.80 maybe, and we sort of fell through that. So from the height of the uh, where where the prices have been trading, move from about this sort of range, and you can see prices sort of dip below here, and then it's. And then the kind of crisis period sort of entered. It wasn't really October, but I would say sort of November. And you can see prices really started hugging that peg. There was there was, you know there's nothing even close to getting up to that former 121.80 to 122 type type area that that had that had been you know consistent trade for four odd years, um, buying in and around the the 120 and, and pushing prices higher again. And you can see something, you know, something kind of changed, and um, you know, most people's understanding is that that was the ECB, the European Central Bank, just getting closer and closer to quantitative easing, and that European Court of Justice ruling was just was that was the final thing that triggered the the SMB to to change their minds about the peg. They felt they wouldn't be able to sustain it. Were there a you know, big barrage of euro selling. If there was a QE program, and that you know, they they lifted the peg and preempted it. Um, but that you know, this it's hard to see here. But the, you know, what we're looking at here is akin to a triangle pattern in a way, where you have a a tall initial resistance, but every time you come off the floor, you just don't quite make it back up to where you formerly were, and you you know that when you have that kind of triangle pattern. You know, this is essentially it. This is the floor, and we just weren't. You know, there just wasn't the power to get back up each time. And you know, that's why that's the dynamics behind this triangle pattern is that eventually, typically, prices break down below that floor because you can just see that the buyers are trying to hold on, but the sellers and sellers are getting more and more aggressive until eventually it goes down. Um, so tricky trade now. Um, you know, like I said, we've got this um, got this range that we're working on at the moment. But um, you know, it'd be a brave soul probably to, uh, to be buying euros against the Swiss franc um, prior to this uh, this the meeting the the European Central Bank meeting this week. Uh, that obviously is the the big event risk that we have this week. Event risk, event pot, uh, event potential. Uh, you know, and the the big one to be looking at, obviously, is the uh, the euro, and we dropped as low as 115, which is multi-year lows as we look back. Really, a monthly chart's needed. We can see we had this kind of rising trend line that I'd mentioned the prior week. That gave way, 
and so really what we're looking at is this this floor from 2005 which we have moved below but if we can um, you know, if we can hold the month above there there is some chance of the euro recovering but again it's a similar looking pattern on a you know a longer time scale where you know there's no p trend line that particularly works here but it's you know it's that general theme of here's here's a sort of floor that's been giving way here's a a um, uh, yeah, sort of declining resistance where each time we've got down there it's just not quite been able to do this you know do as much so if this does give way you know to me this is pretty big and we could even be seeing something along the lines of you know this is a sort of crude objective way of finding an objective from a pattern but it could be something along the lines of this so obviously the first big barrier is parity which people were calling for in the uh, European debt crisis, but never never happened because Mario Draghi stepped in there and saved the currency, saying he'd do all that it takes. Now he's doing all that he can, he can, you know, all that it takes to devalue the currency. So things have changed. Parity looks increasingly likely, but should this pattern play out, you know, we could be looking right back down to these values seen in 2002, and even down below that. So that's just a little indication of the gravity of. Um, you know what's going on here. So, in terms of this meeting, um, there are there obviously high there are high expectations going into this. That can be seen by a euro at 115, but also b uh, Germany 30 at record all-time highs has hit 10300 as of last week, as of Friday, with this huge breakout here, break of this triangle pattern. I have a similar objective that I've set up here, better seen on the, on, on the daily chart, where this was the kind of triangle. So I've discounted this spike at the bottom, used this low here. That connects nicely with these two lows. Use the height of the, tr of, of the pattern projected from the breakout area. That would 100%, so that hold height there from this breakout would put us at 10,800. So this breakout's already started to happen. We're already at new all-time highs. Now, of course, we could see some pullbacks um, before getting there but you know, it seems like the, the race is on now so even if we don't even if we get a bit of a disappointment um, at the meeting on Thursday um, maybe no QE is announced or the sort of German resistance um, means that the, the program is not as big as some would hope um, we could get a bit of a pullback in the Germany 30 but you know the race is on now especially if they do announce just something then that would indicate that probably even if the if the eurozone does sort of um, keep declining um, and we dip further into deflation, then um, then then they'd have the scope to expand the program, and so that would be you know that would be what's needed to get us up to that kind of objective. Um, equally, a failure of that objective, if we do roll over and you know break below these kinds of lows, that's a big bearish sign. You know, if you if you have a pattern fails to meet its objective, rolls over. That's a good indication that um, we could be the beginning of a much larger decline in stock markets. So, interesting either way. Um, the other, obviously, euro-wise, the other thing that we've got going on at the weekend is the the Greek elections. Um, you know, it's, it's politics, and all we can really go on is uh, the polls, which imply that Syriza, the anti-austerity party, is um, is topping them. Samaras's party. Uh, the the prime minister is sort of catching up a bit, and so there could be some element of the sort of um, Scottish referendum effect, where people vote one way in the polls, but then when it actually comes down to it, do something a bit more conservative. Um, remains to be seen, but you know it's tough times for most, for most I say most, but a, a lot of uh, of Greeks with these kind of austerity measures, and you know they probably want a change. Um, so good chance that Syriza will be voted in, but what we have to keep in mind is they have said they want to keep the euro, um, so maybe the risk doesn't even so much come from them per se, it's more almost the the other European nations and how they react to any change in policy domestically um, that, uh, that Syriza introduced. Most likely the other European nations will do what they can to keep Greece inside the eurozone despite all the tough rhetoric from the likes of Germany. Um, you know they won't want the kind of associated political instability, um, but it, 
you know, it does, it it could set the precedent for other nations that think, well, okay, if Greece is just bailing out of its sort of IMF mandated, um, you know, ideas to kind of clean up, then, uh, you know, maybe we'll do the same. So particularly looking at um, Spain and Italy, um, Spain's done a lot more than Italy, but uh, a lot of people inside those countries hurting from those measures, and so they could they could easily follow suit from Greece and decide to vote in someone a bit more, um, yeah, a bit more friendly to their sort of short-term means. So technically, um, we've got this big breakout. We're at all-time highs, so we, you know, it's difficult to find resistance other than sort of objectives from the Fibonacci and the likes. Uh, support's a bit easier. We've got support immediately from this former all-time high. That would be worth looking at. Basically, this sort of 10.100, 10.095 level below there. This next peak, which is kind of the big area that we kind of broke through with these kind of odd-looking candlesticks and this big reversal that we sort of plunged down um, after that SMB debacle and then and managed to pull higher and then rallied on Friday. So that would be a another area should we get through the 10.100. Um, but, you know, given this breakout and the general scope of things, I wouldn't expect prices to get down to this this kind of low that we saw 300 points down on Thursday. Um, but that, uh, you know, should we do that, that again would be another area of support coinciding with this trend line again. The um, the UK managed to manage to rally, not not to the same, nearly to the same extent as um, as in Germany, um, but definitely seen a bit of a turnaround. Um, got a bit of kind of um, uh, on this daily chart, we've got a bit of uh, RSI bullish divergence formed a new low, but a big spike reversal on the can on the daily candlestick coincided with a, a higher low formed on the RSI. Pushed through this 50 level, um, indicating um, in a kind of bullish trend. So it's looking a bit more. It's still very choppy markets. If we look on this kind of wider scale, we're still kind of sideways here, and there's still the potential for this large decline that we saw uh, in December to play out. But we're still kind of in sideways mode, and we could be looking at another run at the highs before this plays in again. For me, 6775 is definitely be, going to be a big one. You know, if we if we get through that, it's going to it's going to imply a big shift in sentiment f from what caused that to then pushing through that high again. Um, which we're already starting to see because that's a, that's a strong couple of reversals of this level. So, you know, you don't typically want to fight against kind of long wicks like that, two of them together implies that there's a lot of buyers coming in around this six uh six or three hundred to four hundred type area. And so six, seven, seven, five, eight certainly looks like it could be challenged at this point. Um but that uh, that to me will be st certainly stiff resistance given that it caused that, that decline there. A lot of this or a lot of a lot of this price direction hinges on uh, on what the E C B do on Thursday. Obviously it does directly affect the UK but it certainly indirectly does. Um, other things affecting uh, the UK 100, but also the British pound, if we flip over to that chart, will be um, average earnings from the UK. We saw last week inflation dip down to uh, the, s the joint lowest on record at 0.5%. Um, so very little incentive at this point for the, uh, the Bank of England to, to hike rates. Um, one reason they might is if we get a further erosion of this cost of living crisis where actually wages go up um, so average earnings push up whereas inflation is dropping so then actually people are earning a bit more obviously the unemployment rates have been gradually ticking down so people are in a better you know better placed um, than they were and there's just less need for sort of the emergency measures associated with a really low interest rate that we have at the moment so that particularly with the pound, we've also been absolutely collapsing since reaching 172, and we're pushing into uh, this 148.40 type low that we uh, that we formed back in in 2013. Um, but we are stalling out 
around this 150 area. One, you know, 150 is obviously a big round number. We've seen these both two sort of long leg dojis for the last couple of weeks. So the unemployment report comes out at the same time as uh, average, average earnings. Um, you know, if we, yeah, if we saw a big tick higher in unemployment, you know, that would that would probably be uh, pretty negative for the pound. But if we'd see stronger, strong average earnings, that that to me could be a could be a bullish catalyst off off here because you can see this um, 151. We'd 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 not been able to to get back through there since since we made that um, that push lower, and we've seen some quite long wicks coming off that so definitely some buying interest there so then if we can actually make it to that one through that 152.70 which we can see a bit better on the can see this is this is basically the action on the four hour chart made that low came higher struggled to get to that 152.70 so far but but again actually found some interest at these lows so this is sort of interim Resistance coinciding with this 55 period moving average. We've got through the, the 21 period. So above there could catalyze another test of 152.70, but really above there is what's needed. Kind of put in some sort of double bottomish pattern and uh, potentially to higher prices. And to me, the natural next area would be the sort of 155 essentially, where these two lows were formed that we broke down heavily. Um, from at the uh, the start of January. Another one, big one to note for the UK on Friday is that we've got retail sales. Um, there was a, you know, US retail sales were pretty bad uh, last week, and that partly explains why US markets closed lower um, while European markets did well. Because, you know, the big hope from the drop in oil prices is that it translates to people spending a lot more. Have a look at the uh, the SPX 500. We have a look on the weekly chart. You can see we've closed lower three weeks in a row now. Got it again. Some big kind of buying off the bottom, as we saw in the in the in the UK 100. So definitely potential to push higher this week. After three weeks of declines, which you can see historically, one two three, one two and an up and a down. You know we haven't had many three week in a row declines. Back in October we, 2012, we did. Um, maybe I'm oh, okay, ago, obviously, here in September. But yeah, not many of them, as you can see. So, historically, been buying opportunities when we've seen three plus weeks. Here it was four, so obviously be wary. Um, but, you know, edging towards a buying opportunity when you see this many weeks declines. But yeah, US sales, retail sales were bad, and so it would be interesting to see. If that's a kind of an international effect, where uh, um, that, that, that that those lower oil prices have really just not quite translated across into um, you know to people going into the shops and actually spending that money. Something that's been driving markets today is, um, and we can have a look here. Um, when it comes to China, we'll, we'll, we don't trade a cash product, but we trade um, the, the front month future. This is the China A50 index, because this is today's move. That's over. T I think that's over 10% as we price it for the day. Um, well, if it's you know it's from above 11,000 down to 10,000 10, round mark. So this is a big psychological level that's offered support a couple of times. Well, once and then another one so far. That's what we're reacting off. But they've changed the, the margin requirements, um, or they've um, sort of in, the regulators are starting to clamp down a bit on margin trading in uh, in China, um, and uh, and that's what's this alongside a bit of extra regulation on their sort of shadow banking sector has um, triggered a bit of fears that this massive run up that we've seen in, in Chinese equities, which you can't see on this chart because obviously it's just this um, front month future, but it's they saw about a, yeah, Chinese shares were about a 50% appreciation in 2014. So certain, you know, without many pullbacks, that was since they introduced um, an interest rate cut, spurring speculation that there's, uh, you know, it's going to be a new monetary easing cycle, a new 
liquidity flowing in, in Chinese markets, so they've been ramping up on the expectation of that. It's not really fully happened yet, and uh, these latest regulations may be the trigger for, especially if we can break below this 10,000 in the China A50, could be the spur for a larger correction until we actually see some bigger move from Chinese authorities. So, but that certainly affects other markets. You know, this um, I think part of the reason we're down in Europe today, and why U.S. futures are down, even though U.S. markets are not open because of um, Martin Luther King. Um, you know, it's this it's this slowdown in, in global growth, particularly emanating out of China, which has driven um, oil prices and then recently copper prices, which are getting hammered again today. That's ahead of the Chinese GDP report that's being um, coming out uh, later tonight or in the early hours of tomorrow um, and the, chi uh, the um, People's Bank of China and the, um, the Communist Party there had a, a growth target of 7.5%. Um, it looks like China may well be missing that growth target for 2014 and for the fourth quarter at least it's expected to come in at around 7.2%. So, you know, they're you know, still much higher growth than in the developed world, obviously, but still much slower than they had been doing sort of double-digit growth only a few years ago. So a big slowdown taking place in China, and that slowdown demand is which is half of what's explaining the, um, you know, the drop-off in commodities. And if we have a look at this copper chart, I actually do have it here. This is a longer-term picture in copper. It's a weekly chart. I did note uh, before the end of last week that if we got a close back above this 61.8% level, that could be a good thing because you see we bounced off this high from back in June 2009. That works pretty well as support. And we did close above that 61.8 level, so maybe maybe that's as much of a correction as um, we're going to get for now, and that could be the trigger for some higher prices. Now that the copper prices have sort of got in the press and things, you can see that maybe we're a bit overdone. And it has perfectly coincided with this sort of 19 uh, level in the RSI. So if we get a, a higher, a high, you know, if we can return higher this week, that would be extra confirmation. And then if we could actually push past this, um, due, what was it, June 2010 low at the 270 mark, that would be big. And then that could be at least a push back to the 300 level. Whether we can get through there, possibly not. Um, you know, that may be another area for, for selling to come in, but. Um, this is the first sign, this kind of long wick that we saw last week, where we, put, we pulled back over half the losses of the week. Um, we're down a bit again today, so that doesn't really bode well. But if we can, if we can hold above this 61.8% level again, even get a higher close this week, um, that would that would imply that possibly we could be getting up to 300 again. Um, And obviously, just you know, use the use the shorter term charts for any kind of track candle or, or um, indicator triggers. But I think, as far as my analysis, it really comes from this longer term chart when it comes to copper. Um, while we're talking about that kind of general demand slowdown story, let's have a look at uh, crude prices. We've you know we actually got a higher close last week for uh, WTI and I think Brent as well. So. <coughs> You know that's um, that's the first time that's happened in a few weeks. So now you know, there are calls for the bottom to have taken place in, in 44 uh, WTI, and it wasn't far off in Brent. It was I think it was about 45 as well. Um, if we look at that Brent chart, yeah, the low was 45.20ish in Brent. Um, that that sp spread between the two really closed up. Um, so you know, slight pullback. You can see the same same thing going on in the Brent chart here. Got a look. We can connect these recent lows just about forming a rising trend line. So I think the way to look at this here is um, you know break below this trend line opens up in a retest of the low, potentially um, you know new lows, and uh, a break through this level, the uh, 49.54 ish. Uh, we had a spike through there, failed. You know that's kind of a bearish sign. But then the fact that we pulled up again to the high is, uh, you know, improves the likelihood of doing well. We've broken above these shorter-term MAs. We're still being capped 
on the daily chart by the 21. So that will probably be the big one. First through this little line of support here, then a close above that daily um, 21 period moving average will be something a lot of people are paying attention to. That hasn't happened since um, since September. Obviously it didn't work then, so it's not the be-all and end-all, but we're obviously significantly lower than we were then. And, uh, and yeah, that was the trigger to break through that longer-term rising trend line. So, yeah, bearish pressure was fully on there. And that was uh, that was going into the, the OPEC meeting up there. Obviously, that's all pretty much priced in at this point. And we are starting to see some evidence that uh, the number of rigs, in the, uh, oil rigs in the U.S. is declining um, as, you know, it just doesn't make, um, doesn't make business sense anymore to be um, extracting a certain value per... Uh, you know, having costs which need a certain value in crude uh, per barrel, um, which are which are higher than uh, the current levels. So, you know, and that's uh, that's part of why we got this move higher in oil last week was the um, International Energy Energy Agency report, which suggested that um, supply from non OPEC members like the U.S. Um, could start to start to decline um, in 2015-2016. So, certainly technically interesting setup here in, uh, in crude. Haven't got too in-depth into the currencies. We've looked at the pound, we've looked at the euro. Yen is certainly an interesting one. We're, we're, we're close to a double top here. The break of this rising trend line, I mean, this is, this is one of those tricky ones where there's two technical things going on here. One is this break of this rising trend line, which I tend to favor because we have broken through this 55 um, day MA, and we did form a lower high there, but we do have a bullish engulfing candlestick for Friday, and this is what you would call a um, a positive reversal um, in um, for the RSI, a positive RSI reversal, where basically RSI has made a new lower low but the price has held and made a higher higher low. So basically, price has held strong in the face of bearish momentum, sort of shows strength in the market. So it's really, are we looking at this price trend line break to trigger lower prices? Or are we looking at this strong price in the face of lower momentum to push up to higher prices? We're basically in a range right now with this um, sort of 116, 115 to 116 is the base. So, you know, if you're if you're assuming even though we're below the MAs, you know, that will obviously happen in a range. At some point you'll be above them, some point you'll be below them, but it's not as technically significant when it's a sideways market. You know, the MAs just hover in the middle. So probably we're gonna push up to the top of the range again. And then if this broken RSI line has any merit then you know we're going to roll over again before we get up to tw uh, 120. But we'll have to see. Um, you know, we'll you know we'll need some shorter term confirmation from the likes of the four hour chart to uh, trigger our trades. And you know, if you're looking at a kind of bigger move um, up into the range or down below the range, then you know you might have a few false starts before you get there. But that's the nature of the beast. Um, not had any Q&A, so uh, I'm assuming, um, oh, okay, there we go. Um, so I'm just getting a question here. On cable, do you think it's going to want to do a retest of support around 150.75? We're going higher. 150.75. I see what you're talking about. Yeah, just these lows, basically. Um, well, I suppose looking at the four-hour chart, this kind of little bullish engulfing pushing through the MA would um, say otherwise. I mean, I guess as I see it, this was kind of um, the level that I kind of deemed to be important here, this green level. We sort of pushed through there, retested, then we just pushed below it, caught, you know, basically ran a bunch of stops below it. Um, that became the new kind of support but it's still kind of a spike bottom. Basically, this vicinity of um, 
150 75 to 150 90 is the sort of needed and i think we sort of maybe tried to get down there again and managed to pull higher without having to so we saw two tests at the top two tests here so i suppose the answer is probably no we don't necessarily need that but keep in mind it's a range and that's the support so you know it's not a trend where you know that's the previous low and um, you know you expect a rebound um, you know it's where we're getting higher highs and higher lows you know where this is the low and this is the next high you know it is a range so it can pretty much chop around anywhere in between this and still hold on to, still hold on to its technical pattern so I guess my um, I would say we don't need a retest of that 150.75, but um, you know we certainly could, and that would mean stops probably need to be below it, um, somewhere below it. Obviously, it's never great to be directly below it, and so the higher you're buying into this range, the less the trade makes sense. So in a way, sort of you know from trading perspective, you always want the best risk reward. So it's maybe one of these where it's, it's basically in the middle of the range at this point. So that's the worst trade you can make in a uh, trading range where buying or selling right in the middle. You know, you want to be buying at the bottom or selling at the top. So if it does come down for another retest, then, you know, all the better in terms of trading opportunity and risk to reward ratio. It may break through, obviously, but if, you know, you're only taking a small risk. But it could obviously then be that third test that's needed to get to the top. So... Um, you know, it's a trading style thing. Have an order down here, and the off chance it does go for another retest for a better risk reward, or if you think it's done, um, you know, buy more aggressively into the top of the range. But um, you know, realistically, you, to be absolutely well, to be the safest you can in terms of this range trade, <coughs> you need to stop below there. But that's obviously a bit high. So then you'd have your choice of having another stop behind these recent lows. But it certainly could chop down through there and then run higher again. So it's one of those situations where, obviously, with the benefit of hindsight, just that buying right there before, you know, as this move happened was was the best trade that's already taken place. But it may happen again, so you could have another one. I know that's a bit of a caveated response. I hope that, um, hope that was useful, though. So that's, um, that's about the, uh, the end of the webinar at this point. Um, we've run a little bit over, but I hope it was um, hope it's useful. Um, definitely big with the, the ECB. You know, really, in terms of European trading, that's what we're going to be building up to all week is that um, ECB announcement on Thursday, and you're going to see lots of speculation. Probably the old uh, ECB rumour mill will um, you know, tell us a few little gems beforehand indicating um, what kind of thing going to be introduced. Often to, often time there are leaks from sources, um, open quote, close quote, that will give us a good idea what they're what they're planning. Um, I'm assuming a program that kind of kicks off QE in a small degree um, and sort of hints that it's going to be expanded should it need to be. Um, something that hopefully won't upset the Germans too much, but will satisfy markets that some sort of asset buying is taking place, which I think will probably be quite well received. But um, you know, should nothing be announced, I think it will take a lot of, um, you know, a lot of talking from Mario Draghi to um, to satisfy markets. Should absolutely no program be introduced, so that could be the catalyst for lower prices. And uh, and retest of those levels we were chatting about in the uh, the Germany 30. Right, thanks all. Jasper Lawler signing off.